eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. The Bible is a guide to help us find the truth about God. The Bible is a guide to help us find the truth about Jesus. And the Bible is a guide that helps us to find the truth about the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of truth that we find throughout the Bible. And one of the books that gives us a lot of insight to things in the nature of God and the Holy Ghost and Jesus is in Romans chapter 8. If you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We are told in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, <clears throat> that the righteous of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the spirit, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because of the cardinal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live, but if ye though the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, it so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the the earnest expectations of the creation, whether for the manifesting of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but the reason of him who he had subject the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole Creation groaneth and truth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan with our, within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our inflammatories, for we know not 
what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. And when he that searches his heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow he also did presents it to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom, whom he did participate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to those things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. You shall lay anything to the charge of God elect. It is God that justifieth. He, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather than that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercessions for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulations, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or prayer, prayer, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> when we look at Romans, and we read Romans 8, it's talking about us as being born again. And that we have the spirit of Christ because we have the blood of Jesus. We're no longer walking in the flesh because we have the blood of Jesus. Because we came up a new creature in Christ. And we are now walking in the spirit. And that's what God has in us, the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8 verse 6 it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we as Christians need to understand... That the mind of the flesh is death. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The big difference in a Christian and a non-Christian is a non-Christian is really dead. And Christians are alive. And this is what we need to truly understand. Sometimes we get the ideal from these non-Christians that Christianity is for losers. Being a Christian is a miserable way to live. Actually, it's the other way around. It is the playboy who is dead. It's the ones that are shacked up living together who are dead. It's the drunkards and those who are doing drugs and all these things that go against abomination to God. They are the ones who are walking around dead in this world. The Christian is the one who's alive. The Christian is the one who knows what life is really all about. As a Christian, I will live in a penthouse, a life. I'm on the top floor. I'm having a ball. The non-Christians are living in cellars. There's no windows. It's a living in darkness. What a miserable way to live when you stop and think about it. <clears throat> the invitation of a Christian to a non-Christian is simple. Come over to Jesus and get life. Come to Jesus. Come to the life. Come to Jesus and come to the light. Come out of the darkness and into the light, because the light is Jesus. The darkness is hell. Romans 8.14 tells all who have ears, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Everyone is led by a spirit. And this is something that we need to really truly make sure we understand, because the fact is, everyone is led by a spirit. The sad part is, 
Most are led by the spirit of the devil, and sometimes we as Christians wind up being led by the spirit of the devil. Jesus told the apostles that when the Holy Spirit is come, he will guide you into all truth. We find it written in the gospel account as told by John in chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus tells the apostles, the comfort, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We also find it written in the gospel account as recorded by St. Luke in chapter 12, in verse 11 and 12. He says, And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what things ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. <clears throat> One area that the Holy Spirit leads everyone is to salvation. Not everyone listens, but it is a fact that all people, when they hear the gospel message, will have some kind of reaction. We see this on the day of Pentecost, as it is written in the Bible. We see this when the apostles were preaching. The Spirit gave them the utterance they needed. We find this in Acts chapter 2. And we see also in Acts chapter 2, when the children of Israel heard this very first sermon given on the day of Pentecost, the Lord's church was open to them, and when they heard it, they realized they were the ones that crucified the Son of God, who is the Lord Jesus. And they asked what they should do. And we also read this in Acts 2.37, where it is written. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And we know that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38... Peter, who was led by the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, told them as it is recorded. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now we understand from Romans chapter 8, verse 14, that those who obey are led by the Holy Ghost and are called the sons of God. And in Romans 8, 15, we are told that we receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And we see in Romans 8, 16, it tells anyone who have ears that the spirit itself bears witness of our spirit that we are the children of God. Some will say, I know I'm saved because I feel I'm saved. The truth is, the Spirit is led by the teachings of the Holy Ghost through the Bible. That's what we have to understand. Jesus tells us that the Holy Ghost will bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I show to you. Well, how does Jesus show us things today? It's through the written word. It's through the Bible. We have to have the written word. We have to study the written word. We have to pray. The Bible is the written word of God. And it's given to us by Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, so that we know how to please God while we're here on this earth. People will say, well, I won't trade the feeling I have in my heart for all the Bibles in the world. Others will say, I don't care what the Bible says. I know I'm right because God told me. How does God tell you if you're right? God does not verbally communicate with anyone today. He doesn't communicate you through dreams or through prophets. He communicates through the Bible, through prayer. But he will only communicate with you if you have the blood. Because you have to have the blood of Christ in order to have the Holy Spirit. So, those people that say these things are not speaking of the Bible. They are speaking of the other spirit. A Christian should know and understand that God no longer speaks by dreams, visions, because he has spoken to us through his son Jesus, the word of God. And that's why we have the written word of God known as the Bible. God through Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles 
and giving us the New Testament. When your spirit agrees with the spirit in the Bible, you have the testimony that you are a child of God. Romans 8 verse 17 says, And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, since we are the children of God through the blood of Jesus, then we are heirs also of God because of we are joint heirs with Christ. Think about what Brother John tells us in the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 7. This is regarding heaven. It is written, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So we understand, while we're here on this earth, we have to work on overcoming. We're always going to be working on overcoming all the faults of ours and everything that is thrown at us. The devil is constantly throwing darts at us. The world is constantly throwing darts at us. And we have to be overcometh. And that means that we're going to be constantly working on overcoming these faults. But we have an advocate with the Father through Jesus. As we are told in 1 John, if something happens and we fall, which we will fall, and we know we're going to fall. The Bible tells us we'll fall. But we go to Jesus in prayer. We ask him for forgiveness, for help, and for guidance. And he will help us through it all. We get strength by studying the word of God. By praying. It gives us the strength. And it makes it harder and harder when Satan, the evil one, is throwing the darts at us for him to hit us. Because that gives us more resistance to those fiery darts of the devil and of this world. We're also warned by Brother John in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. He says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. As a Christian we are looking for the second life. We are not looking for a second death. When we look at Romans chapter 8. Verse 22 and 23. It says. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and trivialeth and pain together until now. And not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves groan with ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The earth does groaneth. We know that. Earthquakes is showing that the earth is groaning. It spews lava out of the center of the earth from the volcanoes. The earth groans. The Apostle Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10 through 11. Thou Lord in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remnants, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. We also groan within ourselves. How many times do we bend over, straighten up, and say, oh, my aching back. You know, we are waiting for the redemption of our bodies. As long as we are in this body, we're going to have trouble with sin. Not until this body is redeemed at the resurrection, resurrection will we be free from the cardinal desires of the flesh. For the flesh wars with the spirit, and the flesh only will see this earth. We've got to understand, the flesh knows it's not going to go to heaven no matter what. But it's only going to have its fun on earth. The soul wants to get back to heaven. That's the war. We are told in 1 John... Chapter 3, and verse 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
John said, The Lord appears, we should be like him, as he said he is made, and we shall be made like him. That's why we anxiously await the resurrection of our body. We also know <clears throat> that the dead should be raised, but the Bible is silent as to the nature of the resurrection of the body of the unsaved. We cannot go beyond that which is written, but boy, it would be sad to think that if you were not in Christ, you're going to be raised with your same body you have here on this earth with all those aches and pains and all that things that go wrong in that body. It would really be sad to think that you would be in eternity in the body that you have here to be tortured day and night forever. Christians choose life. And when Christians choose life, they're choosing a new body as they are raised with Christ when they die. Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? But if we hope for what that we see not, then do we with patience wait for? We are saved by hope. So many people have a hard time with this. They don't understand the faith we have in Jesus. The hope we have in Jesus. You know, we have hope to go to heaven. Let me put it another way. How much hope do you have not going to hell? The answer to these questions is the fact that you don't have much hope because we only have one hope. You don't have two hopes, three hopes, a dozen hopes. We have one hope of going to heaven, and that one hope and that one chance is through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know this because Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that there is one body and one spirit, even as you were called into one hope of your calling. See, we have one hope, one calling, one faith, and that's our way to heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul told Titus in chapter 2, verse 13, that we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our only hope. According to the writer of Dante's Inferno, there is a sign over the doorway of hell that tells all, lose hope, all you who enter here, Hell is a place of no hope. You know, that is one way you can look at hell. While we're here on this earth, we always have the hope of going and seeing our Father in heaven. When we're there, we will be a glorious day forever and ever to be living with our Lord and Savior Jesus. But all those in hell will be looking up with never having a hope of getting out of that place of eternal fire, of the gnashing of teeth, of the backbiting, a place where the worm never dieth. In Romans 8, in verse 26 and 27, we are told, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. We don't always really know how to pray. We may not always be praying as we should be. But we go to the Lord in prayer and we learn to pray. And one of the reasons we don't always know, because we don't really always understand the mind of God. That's why we study the Bible, to try to get a better understanding of the mind of God. So the Holy Spirit helps us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes we not knowing what we pray, we may pray a, what we would call a bad prayer. But the Holy Spirit takes that crooked or bad prayer and it hammers it out with an anvil of faith. And straightens it out and lays it before the throne of God for us. God hears our prayers, not what we pray necessarily, but he understands what we're praying for. He hears our prayers and he is pleased. We find in Romans 8.28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. 
The Bible tells us that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Even in them are called according to his purpose. This is all the big things. This is all the little things. All the sweet things. All the sour things. All the things work together for good. They may not be as we plan. It may not be what we wanted. But all things will work together for good. God did not say you would never get sick. He did not he did say that you would work together if you were sick for what is good. He did not say you would not get fired from your job, but he did say that it would work together for good. God did not say you would not be born handicapped or you would not come down with an illness, but he did say it happens that all things will work together for good. Perhaps we shall say, how can any misfortune work together for good? I can't answer that all the time. But I know this for a fact, that God can make anything into a good thing. He can use anything, if we're willing to work with him, to make it a good thing while we're here on this earth. At the end of life, I'm sure we will see the answer. But we need to be of our faith in the Lord as we go through this and we need to always look at things and look back as we're going through life and understand that sometimes something that happened to you years ago that you felt really really uncomfortable about may help you now as you're trying to win a soul because you can actually talk to them people because you've been there and done that we may find out what the real meaning of tears are and we'll have a better understanding when we get to heaven. This is one thing I do know from the Bible. God knows the way. He holds a key. God guides us with a certain hand. Sometimes with tearless eyes we see and sometimes with teary eyes we see. But we need to study and we need to pray so that we have an understanding. We find in Romans 8.29 For whom he did foreknown he also did predestinate to conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did not predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. How can we read and study what the Spirit says about predestination? Some believe that God has predestination and, and foreordained, foreordained everything. It's already prearranged that certain people will go to hell and certain people will go to heaven. So many people want you to believe. The people read the scripture and they look at it that way. But when you look at what God has to say, it does not make sense that way. We know from Genesis through Revelation... And all the books of the Bible in between, that God's plan for every man ever born was that we should love God and be conformed to the perfect image of God's Son, that is Jesus Christ. To such a glorious end, God intended every man to love him and to be like Jesus. If God had planned only for a few people to receive such an inheritance, such an act of discrimination would have been unjust, and it may therefore, this would be absurd, outrageous, preposterous, and ridiculous that God would show such any partiality. But here's what we know. It is written in Acts 10, in Acts 10, 34 through 36, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of person, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. God is not a respecter of person. God wants us all. He has made it so that we all can go to heaven. But the thing is, we have to obey. 
The massive theme of this great message is God's righteousness. It is in his focus in the words here where Paul's meaning is that even the Gentiles also were included into God's loving plans. Some will say if a people are thus destined by God to be Christians, why are not all saved? Well, understand, God gives every person the absolute freedom of his will. Everyone has free will, and he gives every man that free will. And you have the free will whether to accept Jesus or refuse Jesus. This is the destiny to which God called us through Jesus Christ. A man can live against his destiny, as evidenced by the fact that so many do. But despite human sin, the essence glory of man truly destiny is undisputed. We should all understand as long as there's whatsoever in the Bible, I have something to say about my salvation, and you have something to say about your salvation. As long as there is a statement, like we find in Acts 2, verse 40, that Brother Peter, the Apostle Peter, says, Save yourself from this untoward generation. I have something to say about my salvation. It is true, however, that if we elect to go to heaven, or we select to go to hell. And this election for eternity, now think about these words. We are elected to go to heaven, or we elected to go to hell. But in this election for eternity, God votes for you. And the devil, the evil one, votes against you. And you cast the deciding vote. Whosoever will may come. Save yourself from this untoward, troublesome, unpleasant, and crooked generation. Those who are predestined to go to heaven are all those who, when hearing the gospel, not only believe it, but they repent of their sins, and they are immersed for the immersion of sins, and they live the Christ-like life until death. If you are one of those who are elected to go to heaven, then you have, by yourself, with the help of Jesus, got yourself on that road to heaven, and you are striving to stay on that road to heaven, and God is with you. Paul asked in Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, Paul mentioned some things here, such as tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, a prayer, a sword. Brother Paul tells us that neither death nor life can separate us from the love of Christ. Actually, death draws us closer. As a Christian, death draws us closer to Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Again, Paul says, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is very far better. Remember also how Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. God's plan of salvation as given by Jesus is the same as it was on that opening day of the church. The same plan that was revealed the day of Pentecost is the same plan we have today. Nothing can alter the love of Christ. His love is the same. His Bible is the same. His written word is the same. Hell has not changed. It's just as hot as ever. Heaven has not as changed. It is still the home for the Christian and all those who love God and serve God. Nothing Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord except you, yourself, or me, myself. You see, we choose not to serve the Lord. And that's the only thing that can separate us from our home in heaven. We find this in 1 Peter as we wind down here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he 
that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good. But, and if ye suffer for righteous sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of thy terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of the evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Amen. Jesus desires and Jesus votes to have you in heaven. Think about that. Jesus desires for us to be in heaven... And his vote is for us to be in heaven. But Satan, the evil one, he desires for you to be with him. And his vote is for you to be in hell with him. How do you cast your vote? Remember, everyone is led by a spirit. You have to know which spirit you're being led by. That's why we study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Pray, study. Study, pray. Be sure to do the work of God and to follow God. And the only way we know we are doing that is by studying out the word of God. We want to be sure we receive a full reward. Amen? Amen. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight, today, if you're outside of Christ for any reason, what is holding you out there? If you do not have the blood of Christ, what is stopping you from becoming part of Christ's fold? What is stopping you from coming into the Lord's church? The Lord is saying... That you have to repent, which means you turn away from sin. That you repent and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you go down under that water. You're buried with Jesus in baptism and come up a new creature in Christ. And you stay faithful to the end. Sometimes we do lose our way. And the devil will tell you, you cannot go back. You've spurned Jesus. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says... As long as you draw breath, you can pray for forgiveness. You can come to the Father. There is nothing on this earth you can do that cannot be forgiven if you ask for forgiveness and truly are in a heart that is seeking forgiveness. Don't let the devil take you away from Jesus.